Today, in this discussion, you're going to hear three parts. The first is Chinese Securities Regulatory Commission, CSRC's new stance on overseas listing. This is a major breakthrough. I'll explain in a quick while. To me, that is more important than Charlie Munger selling half of his Alibaba stake because that could be due to various reasons. If you ask me, story changed doesn't make sense. The second is my thoughts on the particular robo-advisor who has actually removed Chinese equities from its portfolio. The third is I'll be sharing with you my thoughts on who will be the winners moving forward. So if you're curious, continue watching on. Hi guys, welcome back. Let's start with the first topic, which is the new updates from CSRC on their confidentiality rules. If you are not aware, let me give you some context to the whole situation. In December 2021, US actually created a new rule that all foreign companies have to open their books to US regulators. If not, they will face delisting and this will start in 2024. And there are of course 200 plus Chinese companies listed in US. Because of this confidentiality rule, they are not allowed by their own government to open their books for US regulators. Simply because China wants its data to remain confidential. This was the key reason why DT supposedly needs to delist because Chinese regulators do not want it to be exposed to foreign powers. But DT themselves are a great story. You know they listed in US via the VIE method. It's a great structure to get around the foreign ownership problem of Chinese companies. And many Chinese companies actually use this structure to list in US. But the problem is this. It was quite obvious that TT did not get the support of his home regulators when he seek to lease overseas. This is further confirmed by this article which mentions that prior to its US listing, TT had weighed a potential Hong Kong listing but abandoned the effort after the city's exchange questioned its compliance with Chinese regulations. So of course, Chinese regulators have to react correct. And in one stroke, they've mentioned that they want to tighten on the VIE structure. And that caused all Chinese tech firms to face a lot of political pressure and that's why the share price for everyone went downhill. And speaking to here, I think there's always a lot of misinformation. It is not true also that Chinese regulators will end the VIE structure. It's mentioned over here, they deny that they are only imposing more rules. Someone is naughty, but everyone is punished. It's a bit like when Singapore governments implemented a no drinking rule after 10.30pm. This rule is of course going to get lifted. But the problem first arose when there was a riot in Little India. Apparently, some people got drunk, caused a big scene, and there was actually a committee of inquiry created to investigate this whole problem. And the verdict was no drinking for everybody after 10.30pm. But I digress. Let's draw back to the case we have on hand, which is the CSRC's new rule. When asked by reporters what was the main consideration for revising the confidentiality rules, CSRC actually mentioned that these rules were first implemented in 2009 and after more than a decade, it has not kept up with changing legal and institutional landscape and the evolving market and regulatory practices. I mean, now then you realize, sounds quite ridiculous, I get it. But hey, someone has to give in, correct? And right now, CSRC seems to be one giving in to save all its Chinese companies that are listed overseas. But I know what you're thinking. Xi's government is known to make promises that he has no intention of keeping. They are not trustworthy. I hear that and I don't defend that. And it's quite likely there are still political risk because they have made abrupt policy changes before, such as to private education sector, such as to gaming industry in China, and the bank on tech companies exploiting the use of algorithms. So as always, before you get invested in Chinese stocks, make sure that you are perfectly comfortable. If there are lingering doubts, then look somewhere else. But in this research process, I've actually found further information mentioned by Chairman C. This regards the common prosperity fund that he is creating. He mentioned that the policy is aimed at narrowing widening gap that could threaten the CCP's rule if left unaddressed. And as I quote, the common prosperity we desire is not egalitarianism. This was what he mentioned in the World Economic Forum, but it's up to you to believe it or not. So my main question for this first segment is that if political risk may be subsiding, does that mean that the valuations of Chinese tech companies should not be such a distress level? Have we seen the end of the Chinese tech bear market or not? If you ask me what is a percentage that I'll 
put my head on. But also, before I give you the answer, I am biased because I already have Chinese tech in my portfolio. I hope it does well. I was previously wrong. You know, I wouldn't have allocated extra 2000 per week for 10 weeks. I thought we had seen the worst already. So if you would ask me now, my gut feeling, I think the chances are better than 50% that we have seen the worst of Chinese tech, which means more than 50% that is the bottom. So we'll, we'll discuss it if it cracks that bottom again. So leave your thoughts and comments. What is your percentage maybe? Or do you have a point of view? With that, let's move on to the second topic that I have for you today, which is my thoughts on this robo-advisor which removed Quap's allocation in its portfolio. This robo-advisor is Stash Away. Let me quote from what Endow Us has actually mentioned in a public article. The title of this article is Not All Robo-Advisors Are Created The Same. I have strong feelings uh, from what I've read from here, so I'll use this as a basis to expand a bit further and discuss with you. They have mentioned that Stashway maintained or increased most portfolios allocation to Quap as recent as last July 2021. And as Business Times has reported, with concerns of secondary sanctions spilling over from Russia-Ukraine conflict, Stashway reportedly sold off clients Quap investments recently at record low. The problem is Quap subsequently jumped 40% on Wednesday, March 16, 2022, just days after being removed from the portfolio. This once again highlights trying to time the market is an impossibly difficult thing. Now, I've done a previous video before that I missed the absolute market bottom. That was bad, but selling out at the absolute bottom, that is 10 times worse. Now, personally, they've used facts, but I do think that highlighting a competitor's problem isn't very cool, but it's really difficult to justify why Stashaway decided to cut losses so abruptly. Taking losses is fine. I've taken losses on a company that has Russian and Ukraine operations. That has actually saved me money. But to sell because there are concerns that China would face possible secondary sanctions, I think that is very speculative because it hasn't even taken place. So that move doesn't really make sense to me. But I also don't think Stash is trying to time the market and then sell and then try to buy back in. I think they recognize a possible error in their thesis. That's why they were trying to sell. Or they have a predetermined stop loss for whatever reason. I guess these are factors more than they trying to do market timing. And with that, let's move to the next chapter for today's discussion. Which Chinese share is likely going to do the best? Let's look in terms of short term. I think the biggest driving factor for short term reversal of momentum is likely going to be share buybacks. What is share buyback? And before I explain the pros and cons to you, help me smash your like button because it's taken our team hours to prepare this presentation for you and hopefully it will benefit you in your investment journey. Now share buyback is quite simple. Company uses its cash to go and buy back shares from the open market and that creates demand from the shares, correct? So if demand is higher than supply, naturally the share price can rise. So are there any cons to share buyback? Quite obviously, yes. Because if a company's shares are expensive or inflated, a company buying back its own shares is just paying excessively for something that is not the right value. Instead, the company should be deploying their cash into its own investments or business growth. That's where there are certain cons to share buybacks. Alibaba is committed to increase its share buyback to $25 billion dollars. If I know this is the biggest amount among all Chinese tech companies, and that's why I have Alibaba as quite possibly the strongest in the near term. But as we can see, Alibaba is not the only one doing share buyback. Xiaomi, they've committed $10 billion. JD, $3 billion. The big surprise could be Tencent, because Tencent does have a lot of cash on hand. So if they do also embark on a share buyback, maybe they could really change their share price momentum and also the overall sentiment towards Chinese tech. I've came to the end of my presentation. Hopefully you've liked it. Smash the like button as always. I'll see you next video. And just now I mentioned about a particular video I shared about me cutting losses in this company with Russian and Ukraine operations. If you haven't seen it, check it out. I guess it helps explain a bit more on what are risk to take note of because now we are talking about risk when it comes to Chinese tech sector. So as always, check out the video and I'll sign up from here. Take care and goodbye.